we can add insects pretty soon, hopefully, to, uh, uh, to this development. Many of you have maybe seen other uh, presentations of mine uh, where I have always said, uh, we're pretty close, you're pretty close, you're pretty close. Well, we got close and we uh, got some major hurdles uh, overcome, both in the US and in, in Canada in terms of the approval process. So for those that are new to the entire uh, situation or like a refresher, here's an, an update on the Phragmites Biocontrol Program. It really was in, initiated through Joe McCauley and some other folks in 1998, so that's over 20 years ago. Um, where we had a meeting and said we needed to do something about Phragmites um, and we need to do more than just use herbicide or other traditional techniques and biocontrol was what we wanted to initiate uh, to maybe repeat some things that we had been done uh, doing successful with purple loose drive. And the people that uh, or the organizations that were initially um, Part of this uh, was here, Cornell University, through my program, the University of Rhode Island, uh, through uh, Dick Hazegrand and Lisa Tewksbury, and then Kebby uh, Bioscience, located in Switzerland and Europe, where much of the uh, overseas work was done. Um, at the time that we had our first biocontrol meeting, it wasn't quite clear. There was still a debate of whether we had native or introduced Phragmites here or what we had, um, and we now know. Uh, through Kristen Saltonstall's work that we have both, or maybe even more, uh, currently it's classified as a native subspecies, and that we had a cryptic invasion that explains some of the differences that we saw. That obviously put a little monkey wrench into our program that we now not only had introduced in invasive genotypes, but also native ones that needed to be taken uh, into account. Um, we produced a questionnaire uh, with my graduate student, Laura Martin. I'm gonna go into that in a moment to trying to understand uh, how wetland managers across the US are, are actually thinking about a biocontrol program and what that would mean if we have native and introduced genotypes occurring. Uh, between 2002 and 2016, we did the typical work in biocontrol program uh, of where we, uh, initially surveyed for, selected a whole bunch of herbivores, weeded out the ones that were not specific enough, and then did a whole bunch of host specificity screening tests that were done at URI and quarantine, and in Europe where we could do some more sophisticated tests uh, because the insects didn't need to be in quarantine. Uh, uh, particularly native subspecies, lots of different genotypes were sent to Switzerland to test them there. And we focused on two species um, that at that time were in the genus Arcanara, Arcanara norica, and Arcanara gamniponta. And I'm gonna show those in a moment in their life cycle. Uh, there were some further complications with uh, um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, particularly invasive, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, endangered species section, um, uh, telling us how they would like to look at uh, petitions and uh, how biocontrol would be reviewed in their offices. Um, that required some rethinking and uh, a little more work. Um, but in the end, by, um, I believe, October or November last year, the TAG petition was submitted, uh, and it was basically simultaneously to authorities in the U.S., which is here is the TAG, the Technical Advisory Group, and the Canadian authorities. Um, that was then reviewed over the winter months, and in spring 2019, Canada were the first to issue a field release permit. Um, so that means right now the Canadian uh, researchers that are um, <clears throat> were involved in the, uh, in the petition are free to release um, Arcanara geminipuncta and Arcanara, Arcanara norica into Phragmites stands in Canada. Uh, in the US we're not quite there. The uh, but the TAG, uh, the review board, uh, approved our petition for field release. Uh, and the remaining work now is working with APHIS to issue a final permit for field release. That's the necessary step, nothing special for Phragmites. And there will be another Section 7 review by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and that's part of the regulatory framework in the U.S. So we have a field release permit in Canada. 
uh, and uh, we have taken the next big step. We do not have a field release permit uh, for release of those species in, in the US. Uh, I will use this opportunity to, because this has been a 20 year program, to acknowledge uh, the people that have funded or the organizations that have funded this work through the years. Uh, as I said, it was initially kicked off uh, through interest uh, uh, and funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and on and off different, different groups uh, have been supporting this program, and we now, again, uh, uh, continue to have funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Those were the initial uh, uh, big contributors, but uh, also New York and Rhode Island Sea Grants contributed something. We get some money from the New Jersey Public Service Enterprise Group uh, many years ago. Uh, then the Army Corps of Engineers stopped, uh, stepped in um, and uh, helped us uh, fund some of this work. And then through two uh, big grants, uh, the current is still ongoing, the New York State Department of Transportation as the major sponsor, uh, sponsor of my program. And I fund the, the folks in, uh, at URI and also at, at Canby, Switzerland. And a few years ago, uh, with the invasion of uh, introduced genotypes in Canada, Agriculture and Early Food Canada uh, joined the, uh, the funders. Their funding went directly to CABI to support the folks uh, in overseas work. And I believe the funding came from uh, at least two provinces, and I believe it's British Columbia and, uh, and Ontario. So thank you very much for those of, uh, uh, some of those folks are listening. Uh, without their dedication and funding over the last 20 years, we wouldn't have been where we are right now. Uh, but despite all the funding, you can't do this without major contributors. And uh, I know I'm, I'm probably missing a whole bunch of them, but there's a, there's a whole uh, host of uh, postdocs, research associates, different faculty and different organizations that have all contributed to that. I'm just, uh, just the coordinator and trying to direct this in ways that uh, would make the most sense in the biocontrol program. Here are the folks that are listed with their various organizations. The folks that I had no time to list are all the undergraduates in North America and Europe who have uh, put sweat equity and uh, some research emphasis into digging Phragmites roots, rearing insects, uh, or whatever task at hand. And then there are hundreds of volunteers across North America that have dedicated their time to go out in, uh, into Phragmites, dig rhizomes for us to grow, make common gardens here at Cornell or in, in Europe, uh, and many other things. STEM uh, sections were submitted to us. Um, and without their help uh, and their dedication, none of this would be possible. So thank you very much, and we hope we can pay back with insects at some time for all the interest and help that we have received over the last two decades. Um, there are some major publications because this is being archived. Um, a lot of the things that I will be talking about here um, are freely available to those of you that are uh, typically behind a paywall. So the ones that are highlighted here in blue uh, are the ones that uh, you can get uh, without needing to pay for it because they're common, they made uh, publicly open access available. If you want to take a screenshot, please do so. Um, and they refer to other to other publications. So the big tag pub, uh, publication or the petition, it's really the first one that you have there. Um, and that was in, uh, actually it's the second one. Uh, the first one is where all the data are archived. Uh, that's an Elsevier uh, situation where you can do that. Um, the big arguments and the discussions of why we're doing this uh, and what the risks and benefits are is in the second there's a debate about whether we should be doing uh, Phragmites biocontrol or not. That's the uh, paper by Casa Grande responding to some other critiques, and you can follow that there. Not everybody is in agreement, as uh, you would always think that biocontrol is the smartest and best thing to do. And then there is something that um, we've talked about for a while, uh, the work of Brendan Curian and others uh, in the Adirondacks uh, trying to manage Phragmites with herbicide control uh, when populations are still small. Again, that's uh, publicly available. So maybe you have time to take a screenshot or not. Otherwise, you can also get in touch with me and I will send those publications out. Uh, going back to the organisms that we had surveyed, 
For in Europe, that was Patrick Hefliger's work and Mark Schwarzland, and when he was still at Cavi Bioscience, was part of that as well. There was a whole slew of organisms, 150 insects and pathogens that we identified or that were known from Phragmites, and we focused on uh, a number of insects. We did them out because they were either not specific enough or didn't have uh, a high enough of an impact for them to be considered useful biocontrol agents. And we ended up with uh, four noctuids. So uh, there are three Akronar species. Uh, I will show them to you in, Arano in Aranostola. Some of the taxonomy has been reshuffled. Uh, we will need to call one of the Akronar species the Nisa. Uh, we don't necessarily agree with that from the ecological point of view, but that's the, uh, the latest taxonomy that we will now um, uh, take on. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so here's the first one. Um, and this is the most widespread. Uh, it's Arcanara geminipuncta. Uh, the second species, um, or now Lenisa geminipuncta. Uh, Arcanara noica was not uh, changed to a different genus. Um, basically, they look very, very similar, even for the trained eye. They have the same life cycle. Uh, with eggs overwintering, uh, larvae uh, starting to eat as soon as shoots are emerging, pupating in the stems, adults flying in midsummer, and they do damage. Um, and that's why we selected these organisms. They were not only widespread, uh, but they were known to have some serious uh, implications on Phragmites populations in Europe. Um, here's just the depicting, the depiction of the life cycle. Uh, they need to change shoots. Uh, depending on which species, they need to do this multiple times. So they can't develop, complete their development in, their, in the first stem that they attack. Uh, they actually enter, go up, they kill the growing point, and then they feed on the decaying tissue in the top of the shoots. Uh, so depending at what time they're actually attacking the Phragmite shoots, they are at different heights um, uh, because the plant obviously grows. Uh, once the, the, um, the growing point is attacked, there's obviously no more growth and that growth stops. Uh, so, um, the, um, uh, and the, as I said, uh, the, the pupation also occurs in a shoot, but that one would be, uh, would not, the growing point would not be attacked. Uh, so, I'm, uh, of course, uh, closer to the ground. Um, here are the larvae of the four species. Right now, we focused on the ones that were most easily reared and the most widespread, which was Arcanara or Lenisa geminipuncta and Arcanara noirica. Uh, we can distinguish the larvae, we can distinguish the eggs, we can distinguish the adults. That's all reasonably, uh, reasonably easy. You will hear me talking most about Arcanara because I don't have incorporated the lame Lenisa in my vocabulary, so, but that's what I meant. Um, we selected these species because they have an influence on uh, the performance of Phragmites. And we tested that, or Patrick tested that in Europe by transferring number of uh, different numbers of larvae to put it Phragmites stems. And you can see that uh, the shoot dry weight uh, over a season is reduced and that the stem height is reduced. Uh, and with these effects, we have stem mortality and hopefully population declines, number of stem declines over time. That's what people have reported from Europe. So uh, these are not just organisms that sit and eat and don't affect a Phragmites performance, but they seem to have a major impact on, uh, uh, on the performance of the host plants. That's why they're good biocontrol agents. Now, as I, as I said before, we had surveyed in Europe and also in North America for the existence of different herbivores. Uh, and when we did that in North America, we actually found a whole slew of different organisms that were all accidental introductions and some native species in native Phragmites. Um, and so that's summarized in various publications. Uh, and I'm showcasing a little bit of the distributions. Uh, the first, and the, hopefully you can see my cursor, that was not intended. Um, the, uh, uh, the top line, all of them are introduced uh, species in North America that are spreading largely from the East Coast. They may have gone a little further. Uh, not all of them are specific to Phragmites. Uh, the introduced genotypes, some of them are attacking the native genotypes as well. Um, the, lowest, uh, the lowest level, the three species to the right, 
Calumia uh, tetramisa triplicus are very widespread. Tetramisa may in fact be two different species because we find it in native and introduced Phragmites. Maybe there's a native tetramisa, they're grass specialists. That's why their distribution is so widespread. Um, we very often do not see evidence of their attack because they are stem, uh, stem miners and basically don't attack or don't affect the performance of native or introduced Phragmites. So there is habitat, there is life in Phragmites, native or introduced in North America. It's not totally devoid of it. There are other uh, organisms that eat, eat the leaves. And so this complexity that's already there, we will now add um, um, the two noctuids to the entire system. And it will be interesting to see um, how that all plays out. We don't think that there's gonna be competition with, uh, with the species other than taking the number of stems away that they may have available for, for the OB position. Early on, I said we surveyed uh, wetland managers for their opinion about biological control. That survey um, was done in 2009, um, so basically a decade after we initiated the biocontrol program. Some of the results that are reported here in the, in the Esteries uh, paper um, have been uh, found again by Eric Hazelton, who published a review about the methods that are being used um, the counties that are highlighted here in red are those where we have responses to our, to our questionnaire. And you can see that the vast majority of people are using chemical uh, or physical uh, treatments uh, that's mowing and cutting. In 2009, the estimated cost was about $4 million a year. Uh, I've looked at the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative just uh, uh, maybe last year. And over the last five years, they alone in the Great Lakes region have spent over $25 million for herbicides to kill Phragmites. Um, so that's an enormous expenditure for a single plant species. Uh, unfortunately, we have no quantitative assessment of the impacts. We may be getting some results back of how many acres were treated, uh, uh, what the impact was on stem densities of Phragmites. We have no idea what that does to native plant population. We have no idea what that does um, to native animal population. It will clearly affect them, but uh, unfortunately those data are very rarely collected. What was an interesting outcome of our survey of the, bio of the uh, wetland managers was because we asked them specifically how concerned they were about uh, our insects that we were studying, whether they would attack uh, native, the native genotypes of Phragmites. Um, there was a very small minority, about 2%, who would never accept biocontrol, regardless of how safe uh, uh, we would think the organisms are. But the vast majority of wetland managers would actually accept uh, biocontrol, even if the insects would occasionally attack native Phragmites if populations of native genotypes uh, are safe. So that's what, something interesting, and I will return to that again um, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in a later slide, actually, uh, uh, in the next one right now. So one of the, I'm not gonna go into a lot of the details how we have done things. You can read up about it. I'm more trying to give you the way forward now. What are we doing now, given that we have uh, um, a permit in Canada for field release, anticipating a permit, and reasonably quick turnaround in the in the U.S. Uh, what have we done to prepare for that, or what could your role be? We can discuss all that. Um, but I wanted to at least get into some of the uh, results that we have used in our petition, and they are out in these papers that you can review if you haven't done so uh, uh, before. What was really important for us was our native Phragmites genotypes safe. And we concluded after all the evidence that we have collected over the last two decades, yes, indeed, that they are. Uh, we can also say, and we use different tests, and you can kind of see the complexity that we have from single stems in cages to uh, potted plants in small cages to free-flying situations. Hopefully, I can use my cursor. This is here where we release free-flying insects they could then choose among native genotypes, introduced genotypes, mixed stands. Uh, and this is the proportion of eggs that were laid on native genotypes. 
And, and you can see as we increase the realism from cut shoots to potted plants to open field situations, um, that was still with potted plants, but open field where the, uh, uh, the females could fly away, that the proportion of eggs that were laid on native Phragmites australis americanus dropped to about 6%. Uh, an open field test, and that was both for Gemineponcta and Neurica. So at that level, we felt that the overposition that was happening there was extremely low. And in part, this ex is explained by the difference in morphology. Most of you will know that the distinction in terms of morphological characters between introduced and native Phragmites is, uh, or a main character, is the behavior of the leaf sheets. Leaf sheaths fall off uh, in native Phragmites uh, and they stay attached to the stem in introduced Phragmites. These moths, the females, lay eggs under leaf sheaths. If the leaf sheaths are loose, which is starting to happen in, uh, in, in late July and August on native, um, on native Phragmites and they lay it at the lower inner nodes, these females kind of wiggle their abdomen under the leaf sheaths and if it's loose, they do not um, lay eggs on these leaf sheets because they will draw, drop off the plant, they're vulnerable to predation, all kinds of other things. So egg survival will be greatly reduced. They don't have shelter over the winter because they overwinter as eggs on, uh, <clears throat> on shoots of Phragmites. So this is also a very important consideration because people very often think that there are ways for insects through evolution to overcome um, the barriers that other plant species may have for them. This is a behavioral adaptation to a morphological character that's not under selection, uh, where, um, where it's not under selection where an insect can influence that. It cannot adapt to the looseness of the leaf sheets. There is no possibility physiologically uh, uh, <clears throat> or behaviorally to adapt to that because those leaf sheets will always fall off. Um, so that's a very, very high safety barrier that we feel we have for native Phragmites. So we know that if we put larvae on that, some, uh, they can actually successfully develop in native Phragmites. Uh, so uh, uh, that's, that's clear, and that's in, in captivity. Uh, what we do expect from the low level of attack that we have is that populations will not be affected because uh, even if all the eggs that were laid on native Phragmites would uh, ab be able to hatch uh, and create larvae, 6% um, of stems being attacked uh, maybe uh, in a population that will not affect the overall health of a population of native Phragmites. Uh, furthermore, most of the native uh, um, uh, populations have small stem diameters, which the females do not prefer for oviposition because small diameters do not allow larvae to complete the development once they're a little older. Um, then larval foraging is limited. They have very low foraging distances. Most of the native populations, particularly out in the east, have very low stem densities. Um, it's not always the case, but if the larvae have to go from one stem to the next to find um, a new stem to attack, the low stem densities that native Phragmites typically has will limit the ability of larvae to find uh, um, a, new a new stem after they have exhausted the resources and the ones they had attacked. We tried to do this in a field experiment last year. P Patrick tried that out in the field. Unfortunately, he got some late frost and all the, uh, the larvae were killed. Uh, he's repeating that this year, so hopefully we have some more information about foraging distance, selection of the larvae and native uh, Phragmites uh, compared to introduced uh, uh, Phragmites. So overall, our assessment here uh, is that native genotypes, uh, particularly at the population level, appear safe. Not safe from attack, but safe at the population level. Uh, um, so, um, a big debate, and I don't know how widespread the distribution is of people that are on this call, is um, the situation uh, of Phragmites in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, what people are suffering from in the Mississippi Delta is a decline of what they call Roso cane, and that's Phragmites australis. There is no native Phragmites that far south uh, in, uh, in North America. They have a mix of different European African genotypes, there's some morphological differences, and then they have 
what's called the Gulf Coast genotype. Uh, a few years ago, um, a uh, Japanese scale was discovered. Uh, it's it's Nippona clerda de Wakuensis. Um, this is the picture of the uh, adults that sit under the leaf sheets over winter there. Um, and the reports from the Mississippi Delta are massive abundance declines uh, of Phragmites. Don't get your hopes up um, for introducing that further north. There is no permit for that. Nobody is studying that. I have some questions whether the scale is actually responsible for the decline of uh, Phragmites in the Mississippi Delta. Um, and what you see here on the left side is the heaviest infestations and the most massive declines uh, of Phragmites. Um, and that's right at the mouth of the, uh, of the, the channel um, that was created to dump sediments if they still come down the Mississippi River, River way far out into, into the Gulf. So the declines are happening where uh, the highest salinity levels are. The problem that people have with the decline of an introduced species in the Mississippi Delta is that it's a lot, it's loss of wetland habitat. Uh, Phragmites is really effective at sediment trapping, so maybe uh, raising the marsh surfa surface a little bit, uh, and you get a transition to open water, and that's considered loss of uh, valuable wetland habitat for birds and all kinds of other species. As you can see here on the right side, um, so Phragmites may be suppressed, there's an open water transition, but there are other species that still grow there. Um, so my question that I have, while I, I recognize the loss, I never think that an introduced species is a great uh, solution uh, for this, particular with the problems that it creates in, in other parts of the country, even in Louisiana. Phragmites is not a solution in my, uh, um, in, in my opinion. One is that low salinity is the low salinity tolerance of Phragmites. The only way that we really have to, uh, um, to control Phragmites, and it was done in New Jersey and in Delaware, is uh, uh, full tidal inundation with full, with full strength seawater. That really effectively eliminates Phragmites. Um, and so we have the highest salinity levels uh, where Phragmites is collapsing in the Mississippi uh, River Delta. Uh, whether it's the scale or where it's a combination of scale and uh, salinity encroachment, I do not know the, um, the experiments haven't been done that way, but it's kind of looks very symptomatic to me. And then the problem of in the Mississippi Delta is not uh, uh, that Phragmites binds the sediments and increases the marsh surface. It's the sea level rise, so climate change, and the sinking of the delta. Um, the sinking of the delta, uh, we don't know exactly what it happens, but it's in part uh, uh, clearly associated with the loss of sediments that are now trapped behind, behind dams. Uh, in the Mississippi River and you don't have the replenishment with, uh, with fresh water uh, in, in the Delta as well. So, um, will biocontrolled affect Phragmites declines in the Mississippi Delta? Uh, the answer here is that I now have laid out the problem that people face there. The answer is no. Uh, why do we know that? Because we did some uh, climate simulations. The moths that we are introducing or hoping to introduce into the US and will be introduced to Canada are temperate species uh, in Europe, in their home range. So the climate uh, in the home range, and I can maybe point this out, and they are basically distributed in this area. Uh, so that central Western Europe, uh, maybe going uh, uh, not quite into Russia, going a little bit into, into Scandinavia. So um, that's the home range, uh, or it's a native distribution uh, uh, <clears throat> in Europe. So we were wondering whether they would actually be able to survive under uh, sudden uh, U.S. climates uh, along the Gulf Coast. So we did, uh, we did some uh, climate simulations in a gross chamber and used eggs as the example because they have to hang out for many months uh, when it is really hot uh, in, uh, in Louisiana and in Florida and other places. Um, uh, and uh, while it's very different in, in Central Europe. So we put them in a ghost chambers uh, with uh, uh, simulating the conditions as they were developing in Europe and in, uh, in Louisiana or in Florida. And the egg hatch success is 60 to 90% uh, if you give them Central European climate. If you give them uh, Southern US climates, the hatch success is zero. 
Uh, we're not entirely sure what the uh, uh, what the mechanism is, whether they're drying out, even though we had moisture with that, whether they don't get a cold period or whether it's just too hot for them to survive that. Uh, we did this uh, at least two different years and in two different locations, and it's the same. So uh, even if a moth would fly uh, from somewhere where it, it hatched down to Louisiana or hitch a ride, and it, will, it would lay eggs there, um, because that can, can always happen, that insects are being transported um, by, by human carriers, um, involuntary carriers, I'm saying here. Um, so in vehicles or others, um, they will not be able to establish populations in the southern U.S. That's unfortunately for a lot of people, if the, our biocontrol uh, is successful for those folks in the southern areas that are increasingly getting Phragmites populations. So if you go to the lower right here, we kind of uh, loosely estimated the distribution that we are expecting of the two insects. Uh, if they were to release. Uh, some people ask us to do Climax modeling, uh, to which I respond, Climax models uh, only use climate variables. Insect distributions are determined by lots of different factors, not just climate. And when people have uh, uh, tried to um, look at distributions and climate predictions or distribution predictions by Climax, uh, Climax is not very good at doing that. Basically, it sucks. Uh, so uh, it gives you data, but they are not reliable. Maybe we're more reliable by just having best guesses. So we're thinking that somewhere in central Canada to maybe the Carolinas, uh, this is the, uh, the habitat and the climate zones where those species, uh, Carnara, Gaminipuncta, and Norica, um, will be able to, uh, to establish populations. That may totally depend on latitude, different winters, and others, um, but that's the distribution of native Phragmites. This is the distribution of introduced Phragmites. You can kind of see that it's not everywhere yet. Uh, and that's the distribution of the Gulf Coast variety or type, type I. Uh, so uh, Phragmites will not, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the moss species will not overlap with type I uh, populations. They are safe as well through their, uh, because of their different stem morphology and will not be attacked there. So uh, no chance for successful Phragmites biocontrol with these organisms further south. Uh, but it also means that the problem in the Mississippi Delta uh, will be needing to be discussed and resolved in different ways. I hope they would do restoration with native species because we have some, some wonderful native species that could uh, take over what Phragmites uh, may be able to, to do there uh, with the sinking of the marshes. Um, a big thing that will be happening in the endangered uh, species review with the Fish and Wildlife Service is whether biocontrol will affect endangered species. There's a whole slew. I reviewed all the uh, endangered species management plans for those uh, that are in the potential distribution of the two insects that I just uh, showcased before. There's a lot of different species uh, from birds to insects to uh, and that are affected by encroachment of introduced Phragmites. So the impacts that we are expecting are beneficial. Um, there are no endangered species that are being attacked by these organisms, uh, or even if Phragmites would disappear, uh, there are no uh, species that are depending on Phragmites, endangered or otherwise, they have alternatives. So we expect that the review in the Fish and Wildlife Service will uh, should go uh, reasonably smoothly. We never know, uh, but that is our expectations right now. Expectation right now. Um, a big concern was always food web effects, right? You bring in organisms that will kill plants, that will create detritus. The organisms themselves can be uh, uh, food for other organisms. Um, right now, we have uh, uh, we're proposing to add two species to already a complex food web. I'm not going to go much into detail, but Phragmites is not totally devoid of life, uh, introduced Phragmites. Um, we will not eliminate native Phragmites, and we will not eliminate it if introduced Phragmites. It's very clear. Um, but by not adding biocontrol agents, we may lose uh, native Phragmites because the introduced Phragmites is overrunning its distribution. Uh, and there's lots of... Uh, 
introduced species, including aphids and their natural enemies that live on Phragmites, and we allow them uh, to thrive or we continue uh, uh, to do the herbicide campaigns with all kinds of unanticipated and undocumented effects. Uh, we don't know what the food web effects will be. Will bats all of a sudden colonize that? Uh, Phragmites habitat? Will uh, native birds know where uh, these larvae are, uh, are, are hanging out? In Europe, uh, we have specialist marsh birds that go after them. Uh, over time, there will be some shifts here. I'm sure that uh, some woodpeckers and others will appreciate a little morsel that's sitting in Phragmites. Over time, they will learn that. Um, uh, we will need to uh, do some of these in investigations, and we need to find some funding for that. Uh, but largely, it's unknown, but it's uh, anticipated that these are uh, largely beneficial effects that, we're, that we will be seeing. Um, so what we have in front of us, uh, that's the work program of the next few years, decade or so. Uh, we will need to mass, mass produce these, and I'm going to go into that in a detail. So I'm talking about the noctuids. You may even think about adding species to our research uh, uh, program, but I will hold off on that uh, going back to Europe and studying more insects for the time being. We have two that we uh, have high hopes for right now. Uh, <coughs> well, we are developing assessment protocols to have uh, the impact be considered of the release of these organisms. And we are interested in looking not only how Phragmites, both native and introduced, um, uh, populations of Phragmites respond to the release of the insects. Ultimately, we do Phragmites control because we are thinking that many taxa uh, are negatively affected by the expansion of introduced Phragmites. So we will try to do, um, look at assessment protocols for many taxa, and that means that we need to have many different methods. And I will show you some that we are experimenting with at the present time. Ultimately, we, uh, we uh, we're interested in the demography. And I'm going to talk about what that means, demography, uh, and in the spread of uh, the pot potential spread of, uh, of introduced Phragmites. Um, when I talk about distribution, uh, that's at least for uh, the, um, the plan in the U.S. Uh, after we receive approval uh, from the from the uh, uh, from APHIS to release them, we need to distribute these organisms. Uh, I assume that there's a whole bunch of people that want them. Uh, initially, we'll do uh, releases here in New York, and the Canadians have their authority where, to, where they're going to release, um, and we'll try to study them. Um, they're always in very short supply early on, and hopefully within a few years, we'll be able to uh, devise methods to have other people participate uh, in, the, in the release programs. And I know that very often once insects become available, more funding will become available. Uh, our role here is uh, working closely with our uh, Canadian partners and other people uh, in the U.S. trying to share the information. This webinar is part of that. We need to do training uh, and we need to do the assessments and hopefully we have them standardized so people are, uh, it's a little easier for them to participate. And yes, we will need more dollars and we will need to have more publications uh, and more outreach. But that's kind of the work program that's in front of, uh, in front of us. We have started a bunch of these things, and I'm going to show you a few just to, uh, uh, you know, tease, tease your appetite. Or, uh, typically in the way that the rearing happens is a lot of handwork uh, because it's really difficult of finding them in the field. So the ways that Patrick has developed these, and we have done uh, uh, similar work, uh, at the quarantine facility at the University of Rhode Island is hand transfer of larvae. Uh, it's meaning you have cut shoots, you insert the larvae, they find the place where they want to eat, and then once they come out of the stem, needing to go to a new stem, you hand transfer them again. That's a lot of work, and then you have to have the uh, mature larvae, you transfer them into vermiculite, and you see that on the lower right, that's where they hang out, and then you can uh, rear them back up, let them lay eggs in cages, um, uh, and then over winter do eggs and, and petri dishes. As you can imagine, that's a lot of work. So um, fortunately, uh, Rob Boucher at uh, uh, Agri-Carson Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge, um, um, he said, let me try something. Um, and there is a diet that uh, uh, he's testing. It contains a little bit of Phragmites sometimes. and not. We're still trying to figure out, because the larvae really eat decaying plant material, 
what's in them or what's not. He has been really, really successful with Neurica. That works great. Uh, Geminopuncta seems to be a little more, uh, let's call it finicky, but basically what you see is a cube of artificial diet. Uh, uh, typically these larvae are sitting on the inside of a stem, <clears throat> but they're eating this, they're held individually, they're pup pupating individually, so there's no cannibalism. That's all happening in quarantine and climate chambers. You can see it's almost like a little restaurant tray that you have on the right side. Uh, Rob shared these pictures with me. So we're trying to have rearing procedures on artificial diet. That would allow us to overcome the one generation a year um, and to uh, increase the populations of these, these species much more rapidly than we would be able to do with much less work uh, uh, than uh, using artificial, uh, or not artificial, using cut shoots in the way that uh, I explained that before. Uh, so stay tuned on that one. Um, uh, Rob is doing a whole bunch of other things with pheromones and others. Um, uh, so uh, he has been in involved in this for, for a few years now. And as I said, we're collaborating closely. Um, I, um, yeah. Next one is, we're trying to understand what uh, the impact of vegetation is uh, of, uh, of Phragmites. And we started this to trying to understand um, how uh, the expansion of Phragmites would affect uh, wetland vegetation where there was no Phragmites. So that's kind of depicted here. So we started this in 2007. Laura Martin, as part of her thesis, did as she established these, we basically have transects that run from the center of Phragmites into an area where there is no Phragmites with meter squares that we uh, demarcate with PVC tubes and we go back and monitor vegetation using the typical uh, vegetation monitoring things that you do. We count the number of Phragmites stems um, and so forth. And over time, we hope to capture if Phragmites, when we established that, was at this level, the, the darker shade, and then it expanded over a particular time frame, what would happen? What does happen to the interior? What does happen to associated plant species? Um, and we can uh, look at animals as well if you we wanted to do that. So, and we did that, that both in uh, native Phragmites populations and introduced Phragmites populations because we always wanted to compare that. So that allows us to also capture expansion rates of native and non-native frag populations uh, and uh, capture impact on adjacent wetland vegetation. This may be part of a standardized monitoring protocol that we, uh, we will develop. Um, it requires some botanical expertise, so it may not be the, uh, good for everybody to have that. What I wanted to show you is what some of these field sites are looking like. Uh, both in native and introduced Phragmites. Uh, sometimes that's heavy duty work. You see me breaking through a dense stand of Phragmites. Uh, that can be very treacherous. So uh, glasses are important um, <laughs> and uh, some heavy, uh, heavy workforce to uh, actually run these transects and find them again. Um, but you can see here in the spring picture, we can still see some of the the markings uh, after 10 years, we didn't need to replace a lot of transects. Here you see one in the spring running into, into a salt marsh. Um, stem densities, as I said, can be very, very high, so it can be difficult to, uh, to find some sites if you didn't, or some, uh, some corridors if you didn't go there for a few years. Um, but uh, you know, if you mark them and with GPS uh, uh, marking locations, you can get back to the same corridors uh, with a high efficiency. So this, this works reasonably great. Uh, here are some of the data that we have collected uh, over time. Um, so this is largely with help of uh, Victoria Nuzo who has been part of that. And I'm gonna show you a couple of situations here just to tell you a little bit about what the impact of commodities is and what we, what we expect as well. So here on the, on the, on the y-axis is the number of native species. Um, and we have native Phragmites here on the left and non-native or introduced Phragmites on the right. And then there's Phragmites cover on the x-axis. Uh, and Phragmites cover can range from nothing. So we have quadrants where there's not a single stem. Uh, so it's cover here in the top rows and Phragmites number of stems at the bottom. Uh, and you can kind of see that there are many more uh, uh, 
species, native species, when you have little Phragmites, and it kind of peters out a little bit, and it peters out both for native and uh, non-native uh, Phragmites. Uh, but you don't need to have zero stems to allow uh, native species to thrive uh, in the presence of Phragmites native or introduced. There's not really a very fundamental difference between native and introduced. So just to tell you, these are from our transacts that we ran uh, uh, in native and introduced ones that, that, that I just talked about. Uh, and here's the cover, and this is a function of cover of native species and native Phragmites and introduced Phragmites as a function of the number of Phragmites stems per meter square. And you can see as you get to high stem densities, even natives get sometimes high densities, high densities, the cover of native plant species goes down and it goes down dramatically. And we see that both for native Phragmites and for introduced Phragmites. So, uh, so for us, the results of this, uh, it's 10 years of data that we have now, native and introduced Phragmites can behave initially similar, but introduced Phragmites has uh, uh, much higher stem densities, or can achieve much higher stem densities, as you can see here. The goal then, what we have, is to redu reduce stem density to now to allow native, at least plant species, to th to uh, to thrive. Low stem densities of Phragmites are just fine in parentheses for native plants because we see that. So then, the goal for a biocontrol program is not eradication of Phragmites but a reduction in stem density. That's what exactly we hope uh, uh, our insects will achieve. So that allows then uh, those habitats that are now invaded by dense populations of introduced Phragmites to function again as, as habitat for native plant species um, and, uh, and native animals. So this is the power of an approach like that. We wanted to use demographic monitoring for this. So this is Stacy Andrus, Andrus' work. And we wanted to understand how our insects would affect how fast uh, plants uh, spread, how tall they grow, what the fecundity is. We use demographic monitoring uh, or modeling on that one. And I'm going to show you what we mean by that. So uh, with a lot of help from uh, students, lots of, lots of dirt um, uh, and establishing experimental trenches here, uh, Stacy is looking at the number of shoes, the expansion rates. So we can do this above and below ground, and later we will then put in what the impact of the insects are on uh, uh, both the ones that we already have in the country and the ones that we are proposing uh, on uh, on Phragmites. And we use both native and introduced populations collected uh, uh, from uh, not just New York but a number of different locations as far uh, west as Wisconsin, I believe. So demography, when I talk about demography, uh, very often it's used uh, for human populations. So if you, if you Google that, that's what it is. Uh, but we also have demography of animal populations or plant populations. It's just not necessarily the first thing that pops up in your dictionary. But what it always says, it's a focus on populations. And when we say populations, it measures birth, uh, fecundity, the death of different life stages. Um, and for humans, that could be what happens to, uh, uh, you know, uh, unborn or uh, babies in utero, what happens to infants, to teenagers, to adults, what's their longevity and so forth. Uh, those are the factors that we like to know or the, the life stages, what's happened to them. Um, and then for plants, we can think about seed survival on the plant, in the seed bank, how many of them will be germinating? Uh, uh, the what's the growth rates of seedlings or adults? Uh, how many of the seedlings die or the adults die? Uh, what's, again, what's the, what's the seed out with the fecundity and so forth? By measuring these different uh, factors um, and then understanding what the transition probabilities are. So as you go from an teenager to adult, uh, for humans, uh, not all teenagers make it to, uh, to adult stage. So we kind of know what the probability is uh, of, them do, of them doing that, and that's for many different reasons. But what uh, it allows us to do is the probabilities of transition from one life stage to the other, which are the vital rates. That allows us then, once we have that information, to project future population growth rates, where that population would increase, be stable, or decline. So that's uh, how the uh, WHO projects where the human populations would be um, uh, in a decade from now or two decades from now. 
It's based on the uh, information about birth rates and mortality factors and so forth. For us, what is really important is the, what the influence is on mortality of uh, uh, fecundity and so by what I call health factors. Again, uh, for humans, it may be smoking would affect uh, your health factors and your survival rate. For us, it's important how insect feeding on Phragmites or other factors uh, may uh, affect how the plant grows, uh, maybe even competition put, be put into, into that place, what the seed output is, what the stem densities are. So that's what I'm talking about when demography uh, uh, is used here. Uh, so this is what Stacy put together from the first year. This is basically uh, a comparison of introduced uh, and uh, native populations, what their population size is and the number of stems. And so she grounded it, but the days after planting. So this is just uh, uh, <clears throat> four months of, uh, of growth and the different small lines are the different populations because we have different populations and the thicker lines is what the mean is. And so what you can see here is that the introduced populations uh, increase in stem numbers uh, much faster than the native population. No big surprise there, but there's a lot of variation in among different populations. We know that. Um, uh, and then here is the lateral spread. How far do the rhizomes go? Uh, again, the introduced populations are uh, doing this much, much further. Um, and so they're almost at a meter uh, of an expansion rate. The native Phragmites population are expanding much, much slower. So we will, we will be continuing that. Uh, ultimately, what we uh, want to do with this model is we'll integrate lots of data that were collected by, by us in many different places, both in Europe and in North America, um, and uh, then put this together with the information that we have on growth uh, of Phragmites, what the impact will be, um, and then we should have an outcome, uh, and uh, this is still in some rudimentary form of how we would like to go that, but we call it an especially explicit, explicit demographic model of Phragmites. So if you think about native and introduced populations, what we're seeing right now is that native populations most likely are stable, maybe declining somewhat, but introduced populations are expanding. Just think about that as the landscape of New York or the US or whatever you wanna have. And over time, we're seeing that introduced populations have increased in abundance and are outcompeting native populations take over habitat. Now we're getting our two insects in there uh, and we're talking about different stem densities. So what we are projecting over time or what we hope to predict is how we, our insects would uh, interact with Phragmites and the stem densities uh, <clears throat> in the future by collecting all this information. And so this is what we are envisioning, uh, that if we get the lower stem densities, native plants and animals will, will probably be, um, be benefiting from that. And that's exactly what we see from some of the in impact experiments. So we hope to see something like this, where over time, there's a shrinking of the introduced Phragmites populations, a reduction in stem density with all the beneficial impacts uh, on, uh, on the organisms that are there. So this will take some time to put together. We will have something rudimentary, hopefully by the end of the year, um, and then we will work on that uh, uh, as, uh, <coughs> uh, as we continue our investigations. It looks a lot of, a uh, little bit abstract right now, but it will make some sense once we put it all together and hopefully have some, uh, some more animation on that one. One of the big things that people are talking about with Phragmites is what does it do to organisms in Phragmites? Those of you that have tried to go through Phragmites and do some assessment know how difficult this is. We have all kinds of idea what it does to birds, what it does to insects, what it does to, uh, to frogs and other species. So we have some wonderful funding uh, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we are collaborating with the director of the bioacoustics program, Holger Klink, at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, who typically has done some of this um, uh, in, in the oceans or uh, out west with uh, endangered uh, owls and stuff. Basically, we put in, instead of putting people out into Phragmites, we put recorders out into Phragmites. That's Stacy here on the right and uh, Katie Lee on the left putting recorders out into Phragmites, and instead of having a person there, you have a monitoring device that records bird song uh, and other vocalizations over time for extended periods of time. Right now, we focus on birds, but we also uh, will include neurons that are calling 
and uh, we will be experimenting with bats uh, right now uh, because uh, that's another important taxon that has suffered greatly, uh, not necessarily through Phragmites uh, uh, in, in vision, but with white nose syndrome. So we'll be, we'll be doing that mostly here in New York. Uh, Stacy has put recorders out in two locations, many of them wildlife refuges. And you can see that in New York and in, in, in Maryland and in Delaware with help from refuge biologists and others. Here you see some, some pictures of what these recorders will be looking like. They're out there. Uh, you need to change batteries and SD cards over time. Um, but they will be recording without a human present uh, uh, recorder or, uh, um, or uh, ornithologist present and it will do this uh, day and night. Um, we've done it with some help uh, further out uh, south with uh, Robert Meadows, who has long worked in Phragmites. We have some native Phragmites population, some introduced uh, Phragmites population. Matt Whitbeck uh, at Blackwater National White Earth Refuge, where we do um, native Phragmites, I'm sorry, um, native wetland populations uh, and also Phragmites populations, and trying to compare and contrast that. So what we're typically getting, and so I'm going to uh, do a little music here for you, is this is the uh, Phragmites soundscape uh, in an introduced Phragmites dance uh, in Savannah, New York. It's not too surprising. Uh, we have a very reduced diversity uh, in introduced Phragmites. Here we just basically have red-winged blackbird and common yellowthroat. Uh, by the way, this is being uh, analyzed through Raven, which is an algorithm. It's a machine learning program. Uh, it's not Stacy sitting there and listening to it, whether she can identify based on the sonograms or others what's there. We run that through a program and it will identify uh, what kind of uh, organisms are calling as long as the program knows this is what we're going for. So here's just a couple of birds, that, as I said, red-winged black uh, uh, blackbird, common yellowthroat, and, fra and phragmites. What we hope for in the future is something that's uh, more secretive and much more indicative of high higher quality uh, wetlands. These are species like Virginia rail. And we will be able to identify that uh, from the recordings. Right now, you need to send people out uh, and do callback surveys to listen for that. And uh, uh, particularly, these rails and veterans are very secretive uh, in tall vegetation. And they don't always call back when, you, uh, when you're out there. Um, there's uh, lots of teams of people out there in New York right now trying to understand what the populations are and or where these species are occurring, or here like the American bitter. We will be able to record all of these with our acoustic monitoring program, and it's not restricted to, uh, uh, to birds. We can go and, and try to see whether we have this going on. Many of the frog populations or of the frog calls are relatively easy to identify and maybe allows us to do, <clears throat> do some abundance. So this is the work that, as I said, is funded by the Fish and Wildlife Service right now. <coughs> we did a little trial run last year and we're doing a much more extensive one this year. And hopefully this is something that we can then deploy uh, and where lots of people can uh, uh, buy recorders. They're, they're, they're reasonably cheap. They're not thousands of dollars. They're, uh, uh, maybe only a couple of hundred dollars where you can actually go out and uh, deploy these recorders and uh, you can archive uh, the material, we'll have it analyzed, so we get some understanding of what Phragmites, what the soundscape and species were in Phragmites, then with our insects that are being released and hopefully a return to, uh, uh, to, to better wetland conditions or you can assess how this is happening when you do uh, uh, spraying campaigns. It was a wonderful method of capturing uh, over extended periods of time what's happening in your habitats. So that's for birds and anurans and bats. Um, but we will also look at insects. And people have used this. These are malaise traps. It's basically a tent that you put in the landscape. That's actually in Krefeld in Germany, where folks have 
documented large scale insect declines in Europe. There's no smoking gun, there's lots of speculation why we have lost a lot of the insects and with it a whole bunch of the birds and others. Whether it's pesticide use, habitat destruction, climate change, or introduced species, be able to deploy these, uh, uh, these Malay straps in Phragmites native and introduced, and these capture the flying insects that are there to have some kind of an understanding of uh, the biomass, uh, not so much the diversity, that's too much taxonomic expertise, but we will have some grounding, some baseline information of what's in Phragmites and what would happen once we release our insects. So um, and that's a method that's much more expensive than the soundscape, uh, um, but it's a, it's a standard technique that will allow us and it will become really powerful for long periods of time. I wanted to uh, close out um, with some of the uh, information about hybrids. Um, and a lot of you may be interested in that. Uh, I have, we will study this a little more. We have uh, one hybrid population here at the Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge in New York. There are other confirmed populations and they are reliably confirmed in Las Vegas and Nevada. Everything else that you may have heard, uh, I have questions about, and so uh, has Kristen Saltonstall. It requires some detailed microsatellite analysis and programs to analyze that. Um, and it hasn't always done reliably, um, looking at the different markers. Kristen will know much more about that than I do, um, but be suspicious about people saying we have hybrids here and we have hybrids there, unless you have reliable genetic information. And that, at the present time, is only at two locations, um, or two sites, in New York, in Montezuma, and in Las Vegas. Uh, here are bundles that I just harvested a couple of week, weeks ago, at Montezuma, uh, and you have uh, native, hybrid, and introduced populations from right to left. Uh, I gave, give you an Im impression of how tall they are, putting them to um, my F-150 that's standing there, um, and the hybrids are in the center, and you can kind of see they're almost taller than, uh, uh, than the introduced ones to the left. Um, you can't quite see what the morphological differences are, and they're only reliable right now, for what we have uh, uh, at this time of the year. Here's a little closer up. Um, and I wanted to pinpoint the things that are really important. Um, and is again, the, uh, the leaf sheets are important on that. On the, native, on the native ones here to the right, basically all the leaf sheets are off. Uh, there may be a couple here and there uh, in, the, in the higher uh, portions of the shoot. Um, uh, where you still have a couple of leaf sheets. In the hybrid, basically you lost all the leaf sheets uh, in the lower third, uh, maybe even a little further, and they're kind of loose. Um, they can be easily twisted off. Uh, for the introduced ones, you will have leaf, sh uh, leaf sheets all throughout. Some of the lowest internodes may have lost their leaf sheets, um, but very often you see remnants of that still sticking around. They're really hard to twist off. Those are the best characters at this time of the year that we have. We have them now uh, in, uh, uh, in, in standard uh, conditions. We will grow them out. There are some other characters that we will be looking at. Hopefully, we'll have some more information about the morphological differences between hybrid native and introduced populations. Uh, what you can't quite see is of the stem gloss uh, differences where they are really dull in the introduced ones, somewhat intermediate as you would expect on a hybrid and really still shiny and glossy on the right one. Uh, and there is uh, a little brown tint to uh, both the, uh, the native ones and the hybrid ones. So we'll work more on that one, uh, um, but if you don't see these differences of having lost a lot of the leaf sheets um, and you think uh, um, that I'm sorry, let me start it again. So if you have populations where you have lost some leaf sheets, don't think that you have a hybrid. Uh, you have to lose substantial amounts or substantial numbers of leaf sheets before I would consider, hey, maybe we should do a genetic analysis on this one. This was just uh, throwing it because I see a lot of people wondering about hybrids that they have in their, uh, uh, in their habitats. I'm happy to look at stem samples that you want to send me. Um, uh, lots of people have done that. So what's the outlook? Uh, releases are pending uh, 
somewhere in, in 2019 or 2020. Uh, definite decisions have not been made, but uh, as it is my understanding that releases will be made in Ontario. Um, hopefully, we'll have a quick turnaround <coughs> at AFIS and a review with the with Fish and Wildlife Service section, section 7, uh, the Endangered Species section. Um, as we are waiting for that decision, we are continuing to develop release mass production uh, uh, techniques. Uh, we will think about how we will uh, distribute organisms uh, initially locally or regional and then education systems to allow people uh, to uh, become uh, specialists in, uh, in the assessment, in the rearing, other things, similar to what we have done with the purple booster system. Some of you may, may remember or even participate in. Uh, a big plug for me is that we need to consider active restoration. Uh, our insects will be able to reduce uh, Phragmites performance, hopefully, um, and stem density, but they can't be the ones that plant native species that have been eliminated uh, due to uh, invasive Phragmites uh, uh, encroachment in areas. So those of you that have local responsibilities need to think about how do you get the native plant species back in the places where you want them. Uh, and then we need to assess outcomes. Uh, and I said, we have a standardized protocol and development that we will be sharing with you and hopefully it will be the same in Canada and the US. Uh, that will become very important in the future. So when I'm thinking about the future management of Phragmites, I have a few proposals for you. Right now, uh, at least in the US, I can't give you biological uh, 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 control, but hopefully I can do it in a, in a very short period of time. Uh, many of you will still uh, rely on mechanical or chemical uh, things. Uh, to achieve desired outcome. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that is not very successful. Uh, but you need to know what you want in the, in the system in terms of ecosystem function and plant and animal communities. In some places you may need to bring it back, whether you do biological, mechanical, chemical uh, control. That's important. Uh, I encourage you to measure indicator, indicators, not just fragmites. We're developing that for, uh, for our biocontrol program and other uh, places as well, so stay tuned. Um, we need to have the monitoring long-term or the assessment, and we need to assess not just Phragmites. Uh, so our uh, work with the, uh, uh, with the mon monitoring of vegetation or the recorders is really important because you can do that long-term. Have areas that are not being treated uh, to just understand how Phragmites affects uh, uh, or your control treatment affects that. Reward protection instead of area treated. So for me, that means targeting early and small areas because those are really the only ones uh, that you can effectively reduce given uh, uh, the current limitation of to mechanical and largely chemical methods. If you think you need aerial treatments, it's far too late. And the consequences that you suffer may be, uh, the negative consequences may far outweigh the temporary benefits of reducing populations. We have very little information about that. As I said, uh, develop active restoration uh, because either uh, other introduced species will take over the places. Um, that was the problem that we had with purple loose strife. We didn't really get the wonderful native plant populations back because we didn't do active restoration, lesson learned. Hopefully we'll do it different with Phragmites. And you may need to create local nurseries for, for plants as source materials <coughs> once we deploy biocontrol agents. And here is the uh, work of Brendan Crean and others from the, from the Adirondacks where they went out and they had really small populations and what, <coughs> with dedicated stuff and, and, and funding, they were treating almost all populations they could find and had access to in the Adirondacks, which were really, really small. This is meter squares that you see on the, on the y-axis. And here's the probability for eradication. Uh, you cannot eradicate populations, even with very dedicated and annual treatments, uh, unless they're really, really small. Um, and uh, Brendan has high hopes that he can eradicate some more if he keeps at it, because you can suppress populations. Um, but the chances of eradication, if you exceed 100 meters squares, are really, really, really low. Uh, so that's a sobering news for many of the people that try to do large-scale treatments. But treatments can suppress larger populations, but they need to be applied in perpetuity. And as I said before, we have very little uh, idea what that does to non-target organisms. So that's why we're in the biocontrol uh, program, and that's um, um, hopefully what uh, we can uh, um, deploy very shortly. Um, so 
if I summarize where we are right now, chemical treatments, large, largely undocumented impacts on non-target species, often we don't know. They are ineffective uh, because you have to do it over and over again. Native genotypes disappear. They're overrun by the introduced ones um, if we don't do anything. Biocontrol is not entirely risk-free. I summarized that for you. Uh, but negative impacts, particularly at the population level, uh, have very low probability. I can't give you a guarantee that biocontrol will be successful. Um, we do not know whether we can suppress Phragmites or our insects will be able to suppress Phragmites or whether that will restore habitats. Um, most likely you will have to have a human hand in there to bring in the species back that are desirable. Uh, how quickly will the insects become available? I can't tell you that. Um, it will depend on our rearing success. It will depend on how quickly we will get the approval for field release in the US. It will be released in Canada, as I said. We will make protocols available and will continue outreach such as, uh, as this webinar. And I'm sure there will be a, a dedicated web page uh, uh, that will be coming uh, soon too, uh, where you can uh, um, uh, link in or subscribe to that. So whenever we have updates, that will be more frequent than me telling you, oh, we're, we're working on it, we're working on it, we're working on it. Uh, hopefully the pace will quicken a little bit. Um, that's what I have to say. Thank you very much uh, for now. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions uh, for those of you. Audrey will moderate that. Uh, again, my appreciation to everybody who has contributed to that, whether that was local collections, whether that was help with... Uh, uh, providing us access to sites, information, or funding. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. It has been a long ride, 20 years. Um, uh, but hopefully, we, as I said, we will quicken the pace. Uh, we'll have something for you that can be deployed uh, in the invaded in habitats and not uh, affect the native ones. Thank you very much.